Okay, welcome back to another episode of the No Lift podcast. This is the first episode of 2022. I am your host, as always, Arthur Lynch. And joining me for this episode, I am delighted to welcome back Ian Dara onto the show. Ian, uh, good morning, as it still is uh, for another half hour or so. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, very well. Uh, it's not like we've been talking for an hour before or anything like that. Uh, no, as per usual. Yeah. yeah, yeah, natural progression. I thought you were going to say, yeah, uh, this is the first episode of 2021. My mind is still wired on last year. That's uh, a very early day. It hasn't happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make sure 22 <laughs> as I was midway through that sentence. Uh, how, so, how are things with you? Ah, uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not too, well, actually, sorry, no, they're terrible. Uh, as I was telling you earlier, I had a massive back spasm training last night. So if anyone's watching the YouTube video and I'm fidgeting around and like I'm actually have a pillow under my hands here that I'm, I'm like hunched over. Uh, apart from that, everything is great, but I'm in a lot of pain right now. So um, that's uh, that's it. Uh, what about yourself? No, nothing of uh, the nothing in the back spasm realm, thankfully, uh, although I'm Pretty, pretty good uh, overall, really. Um, don't mean to brag. Uh, your, your story reminds me of an episode uh, that I did last year with Adam Meekins. And it was like a week after he'd like, like properly hurt himself. Um, you know, a very severe um, episode of, of back pain that, that persisted for quite a while. And... Uh, like in fairness to him, he still did the episode. He was clearly in a lot of discomfort throughout and you saw him readjusting his position. And like, I think towards the end, I kind of felt like saying, I'm so sorry for putting you in this position for an hour. Like I, I, I really am. Cause uh, no, he was a, uh, he was a trooper to get through it, but you could clearly see he was in quite a bit of discomfort. No, well, I, I think I might uh, at, at best take second place from him now. I'm not, I'm not that bad, but I'm, I'm struggling a little bit, you know. Uh, and, as, you know, as anyone who's lifted for a while, it's not my first rodeo with back pain, unfortunately, but we'll, we'll persist. Mm. For the sake of the Journal Club, Arthur, I will, uh, I will persist. <laughs> right. So today's episode, we're going to focus on muscle glycogen and specifically muscle glycogen utilization in what I would describe as a fairly ecologically valid training session. Um, I, I, I think that's fair to say. Uh, so, so the paper we're gonna discuss is by Hocken et al, 2020. And the title is Subcellular Localization and Fiber Type Dependent Utilization of Muscle Glycogen during heavy resistance exercise in elite power and weightlifters uh, and, and Olympic weightlifters. It really just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> they always do, yeah. So uh, do, do you want to give a bit of a background to this investigation? Yeah, well, this is actually quite a quite a nice paper. Uh, and it did get a, it came out uh, two years ago now, I guess, technically. Uh, mm -hmm. And it did get a bit of press when it came out. Um, two of the, the lead authors on this, um, just Niels Ortenblad and Joachim Nielsen, uh, I've definitely butchered the pronunciation of that. These are two of the kind of leading guys um, in the investigation of um, kind of the, the subcellular localization of glycogen. So which I guess we'll explain that in a minute. But the overview of this paper is essentially what they did is they um, got some relatively trained uh, weightlifters and powerlifters subjected them to a fairly standard session under, um, I, I think, um, like you say, quite ecological circumstances. Uh, and what they wanted to look at was uh, not just the depletion of glycogen, um, and we'll explain what that is and why it's relevant in a second, but more so uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, subcellular like difference in subcellular location depletion of glycogen so not just was it depleted yes or no but was it depleted and where was it depleted most uh, and as we kind of progress to the episode we can talk about why um kind of difference differences in the depletion of certain subcellular localizations of glycogen uh, are relevant in consideration for 
fatigue during exercise, but also kind of preparing yourself for a subsequent training session uh, in terms of recovery and ensuring you are not overly fatigued for your, your next training session. I actually think there's probably, uh, I mean, we're going to be extrapolating well beyond the results of the study to say that, but um, I think there is implications for both training prescription and uh, nutrition, uh, like post or intra exercise nutrition based off some of the results of the study, if you, you, you extrapolate very far outward. Um, very well then. So we'll skip to the uh, introduction. And so what was nice here is that, and I think this will kind of, I think maybe make this a little bit more relatable for people. So they, they, uh, they cite two papers in the introduction that are, that are quite interesting. And the reason I say that is because um, I was generally of the opinion that people were inclined to maybe misinterpret the findings of these papers. So for instance, um, you know, back in the day when I train in a commercial gym more regularly and you'd meet the, the local gym bros and they tell you about what they're doing in their training and their nutrition. Um, I remember one incident where I met uh, a mate of mine who was telling me that he was doing keto and I was sort of querying, you know, his rationale for that. And he was saying, well, I was reading this study that showed that after an intensive resistance exercise session, you only deplete muscle glycogen by about 30%. Um, so therefore I think I'm going to be fine. And I thought that was, that was interesting and nice to know that he's at least basing it on research, but I, it just didn't quite sit right with me. Um, and then as we're going to get on to in a little while, I, I think that skepticism has been somewhat vindicated by, by this paper. But basically the, the papers that they cite, so there's, there's two studies, uh, one by Pasco in 1993, where they did uh, sets of six reps at 70% until they reached fatigue. So roughly around eight or nine sets. These are untrained individuals, 30 seconds rest between sets, and the protocol reduced muscle glycogen content by 30% or so on, on average in the fastest lateralis. Um, and then the other one was by Essen Gustavsson and Tesh in 1990. And this was an absolutely disgusting uh, training protocol. So it was five sets of 12 front squat, back squat, leg press, and leg extension. Um, I, I can't fathom doing that. But anyway. I would be volunteering for that study. No. <laughs> but uh, similar kind of story, around a 30% reduction in muscle glycogen content. Um, so the, the, the conclusion you could take from that is like, oh, well, therefore, it's no big deal, right? Um, and as I say, it just didn't quite sit right with me. Yeah, I, I guess the first thing we should do is uh, uh, take two steps backwards and maybe say, well, why would it matter? Like, what is glycogen and why would it matter whether it was depleted or not depleted? Mm -hmm. um, and just for people who don't know, uh, glycogen is essentially, uh, to use the, the technical term, it's, it's what we call a carbohydrate polymer. So it's essentially a, a complex carbohydrate structure that's stored uh, within skeletal muscle uh, and also the liver primarily, but it, it's, it's present in other tissues as well. You have glycogen in your brain and, and, and other tissues also. But uh, essentially what it's used as is, is a fuel reserve. You know, carbohydrate is the preferred fuel of skeletal muscle during any kind of intense activity. Uh, and so obviously by having like a store of it there, which it, which is glycogen, uh, it's quite useful because, you know, your fuel tank is close to your engine, so to speak, you don't have to rely on carbohydrate coming from circulation or anything like that. Uh, and then obviously it, it, there, there's associations, uh, primarily, or sorry, it, almost entirely in endurance exercise between glycogen depletion and exercise performance. So, you know, there are studies previously where say, you would uh, deplete someone's glycogen by having them do uh, a bout of exercise. You would uh, have them avoid carbohydrate refeeding and then say, have them come in a subsequent day or a day after, or, or a couple of days after 
having depleted glycogen and not replenished it uh, and get them to do intense exercise and their performance is poor. So obviously there's associations between that and intense exercise performance. So the idea that where, like in these previous studies where, as you've outlined, some of these protocols are extremely intensive and high volume, but the, the level of glycogen depletion is modest. The suggestion would be that uh, carbohydrate is not um, uh, a very important substrate or fuel source during resistance exercise and you know to, to go back to your anecdote about your your friend or colleague who was doing keto they could draw the conclusion that um it's not very important for them to be consuming adequate carbohydrate around i don't know if that person was doing high volume training but let's uh, throw them under the bus and say they were uh <laughs> carbohydrate consumption is not uh, not uh, an important factor of consideration for recovery or preparation for, for high volume resistance exercise. Uh, now, the caveat that you would have to place on those studies, um, and this is me being a, a bad uh, student here, I actually didn't read them. So I don't know if they did fiber specific, uh, so fiber type specific examinations of glycogen content. Uh, which is one of the things that's done in this paper, but um, they definitely wouldn't have done subcellular localization analysis. So looking at different locations of glycogen within individual muscle fibers, which is also done in this paper. So what you have in those results, essentially, uh, presuming it's, it's a homogenous sample is you have uh, an estimate of glycogen depletion from whole muscle. So it's, it's devoid of some context, which this paper has identified as maybe being important. So what I mean by homogenous is you've basically got a mixed sample of muscle and you've measured how much glycogen was kind of there before and after from two separate samples, uh, the resistance bout, uh, irrespective of what fibers the glycogen depletion was in or where within each muscle fiber uh, the glycogen was primarily depleted. Uh, I guess the next thing that's important for us to do probably before we move on is just identify the three locations of glycogen within a skeletal muscle fiber. Uh, and as we progress through the, the, the paper, we can talk about how each, um, how each subfraction is potentially important for uh, exercise metabolism, but also the generation of fatigue, uh, because that will kind of uh, enlighten why looking at this, looking at this at this nuanced level is important for, for getting, getting the context as to how uh, the idea that carbohydrate is maybe not relevant for resistance training performance um, is perhaps not true or probably not true i think seems to be our bias yeah so uh you want to run through this then uh yeah i can if you you'd like me to so uh for people who are watching on youtube um we have an image up just for uh well, because it's 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 obviously easier. But for anyone who is listening over Spotify, uh, it's important to kind of remember what the structure of a muscle fiber looks like. And if if you think about a muscle fiber as essentially uh, a long continuous cylinder, that would be the fiber itself. It's got a skin-like sheath over it, which is called the sarcolemma, which is the membrane of the muscle fiber itself. And then if you were to, to cut the muscle fiber open and look inside of it, you've got these long rod-like uh, structures called myofibrils. Myofibrils are made up of, they're essentially the contractile apparatus of a muscle fiber, which means they're the part of the muscle that, uh, that contracts, they're the pistons in the engine, they're what cause it to produce force and enable movement. And they're made up of these long rod-like structures called myofibrils, which are made up of um, mostly proteins. Um, that's the majority of the muscle fiber. You've also then got this uh, system called the transverse tubule system, which is, again, these are essentially, um, you would see them described as invaginations in, in the muscle fiber membrane, but that would probably be not the right way to imagine them when you're thinking about a muscle fiber in three dimensions. Instead, you should think about them more as like pores. So it's this membrane pore system that penetrates inside the muscle fiber. So when you think of a muscle fiber as a rod, don't think of it as just a straight rod. Think of it more like a rod that's kind of got these puckered holes in it like a pumice stone. And that's the transverse tubule system. So they make up the kind of main structures of the, the muscle fiber. And when we look at glycogen, which is again, that, that stored carbohydrate, we see it stored in three separate locations. The first place we can talk about it being stored is uh, in the intermyofibular space. So that's between myofibrils. So again, just to go back, 
if a muscle fiber is a long cylinder, inside the muscle fiber, there's these rods that penetrate all the way through. Uh, the intermyofibular glycogen is the glycogen that is stored between each rod or between multiple rods. Uh, that makes up the majority of muscle, muscle glycogen. So it's 75% is on the image here, but uh, you see estimates of 80% as well, somewhere between 70 and 80%. Uh, the reason the majority of muscle glycogen is in the intermyofibular space is um, presumed to be because that's also where the mitochondria reside and the mitochondria will be the primary consumer of glycogen. So again, if, if the, the mitochondria is essentially the engine for the muscle to work or produces the, the uh, ATP that the, the muscle needs to contract, uh, having the fuel source for that ATP production in close proximity makes sense. So that's why it's um, presumed that in, why intermyofibular glycogen is, is in the highest concentration. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second we have is intramyofibular uh, glycogen. And what that refers to is glycogen that is stored within a myofibril. Uh, and it's actually mostly stored um, kind of at the interface between uh, the T-tubule and uh, an individual or at T-tubule and uh, uh, um, a myofibril. So essentially the transverse tubule, which again is, is those pores that penetrate the muscle fiber, they carry the, the essentially the activation signals for a muscle to contract. So the intramyofibular glycogen is essentially located at the interface between where a signal for a muscle to contract will be received uh, and from the element of the muscle itself, the myofibril, that will contract when the signal is received. And we'll talk about why that's relevant for fatigue later on, but th that's all you would need to know for now. Mm. The last uh, glycogen fraction, and th that takes up about, you see five to 15% here. Most actual experimental papers I read have an estimate of 10 to 12%. The last one then is the subcircle hemoglycogen. And, and this is probably the, the subfraction we know the least about in terms of its relevance. But that's essentially glycogen that is located just under the surface of, of the muscle, uh, the muscle fiber membrane. So uh, essentially just below the skin of the of the muscle fiber. And again, that that's estimate ranges between five and fifteen percent. But usually, 80, 10, 10 is the best way to think about it if you want to think about it simply. So those are three subfractions of glycogen. Um, and essentially, what this paper explores is uh, how they deplete differently between muscle fiber types, slow twitch and fast twitch and uh, subcellular locations, so inter, intra uh, myofibular and subsarcolemal, seeing how resistance training influences that, which again provides more context uh, other than just, whereas those previous studies would have simply just said glycogen was depleted, or estimated glycogen to simply be depleted, irrespective of, of where it was located within the muscle fiber. Okay. Uh, I might piggyback off the intramyofibular uh, glycogen uh, content, if that's okay. I hope I won't end up stepping on your territory, though. <laughs> You're more than welcome to. Okay. Um, no, the only reason I bring it up is because the authors of this study pose a very interesting mechanism whereby a reduction in glycogen content could have a adverse effect on the muscle's ability to produce force, and that's specifically if the intramyofibrillar glycogen content is depleted so within your myofibrils here if glycogen content is lower then this negatively affects the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is a key uh, or it was a crucial component for the the cross bridge cycle so you can almost liken calcium to a key to the lock effectively in the cross bridge cycling because what it does is it binds with the troponin complex and once it does that that enables it to move troponin and tropomyosin away from the myosin binding site on the actin protein once that binding site is then exposed the myosin uh, head can attach to the actin molecule and perform what's known as the power stroke um, if effectively force generation you know at that really like microscopic level um so if if there was a uh a, a slowing of the calcium release then you wouldn't be able to form those cross bridges as effectively or as, as quickly 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, and there's actually, it's uh, I guess because you, you've brought it around, there's actually kind of three. So intramyofibular, uh, intramyofibular uh, glycogen, uh, which is again that the, the glycogen that's located within each uh, contractile rod myofibril, uh, is is the the subfraction which is most associated with um, uh, fatigue in muscle. And there's actually three mechanisms that uh, we think uh, may contribute uh, how oh, three mechanisms by which a depletion of intramyofibular glycogen may contribute to um, a, a reduced capacity for a muscle fiber to produce force. So you've mentioned calcium handling, which is one of the first ones. So there's, there's two elements of calcium handling, which may be affected by a reduction in intramyofibular glycogen. The first is calcium release. So uh, essentially um, calcium is stored in, and again, if you're looking at the, uh, if you're actually, uh, yeah, no, it's not actually located on this image, but irrespective, if, if you want to imagine the t tubule so if you imagine you've got a myofibril so you've got a rod and then you've got a t tubule which is basically like a t-shaped hole which is just on top of the uh, the myofibril itself the contractile element on the the right and left hand side of each uh, t tubule so of that t-shaped hole and above the myofibril uh, is a storage compartment called the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum. And that's where calcium is stored. And essentially uh, in repeated muscle contractions, so for cross-bridge cycling, as you've elegantly explained earlier on to occur, um, you need to see a continual release and reuptake of calcium. And uh, as you say, that's essentially to, to free up a myofibril for uh, cross-bridge cycling contraction. So what happens during exercise is you'll see a release of calcium, uh, you, it'll enable a cross bridge cycle to occur in a relaxation phase. You'll see a reuptake of calcium, and then uh, the cycle will repeat itself. Uh, these are energy dependent processes, and uh, just based off where they are. So their proximity is is the T tubule, which is mostly uh, more closely related to intramyofibular glycogen. Uh, you'll see uh, an effect on the ability to reuptake calcium. So what that means is, um, and the, the circa pump uh, for which there is um, a, a transporter which is dependent on ATP, uh, if you see a depletion of glycogen, you'll see a lower availability of ATP for that pump to work, and you'll see a poor reuptake of calcium. The, the constant presence of calcium will have an effect on cross bridging, but also the fact that less is taken up, it means less is released. Uh, with each contraction, and that that also has an influence. So that's one mechanism, or the, technically two mechanisms by which uh, a depletion of intramyofibular glycogen will contribute to fatigue in that regard, because that's it's the fuel for that that uh, that pump to work. The second is to do with uh, something called a, a sodium potassium ATPase pump, and these are also uh, densely located in the T tubule, which we actually have an image of here. Um, so in, in the T-tubule, the, the, and these are involved in essentially regulating the, uh, the electric charge of the, the outside of the muscle fiber. So when a muscle is caused to contract, uh, it's essentially done by an electrical signal. So there's a, a change when um, neurotransmitters are transported across the neuromuscular junction. Uh, there's a change in the membrane potential of the muscle fiber, the electric charge of the muscle fiber, and that causes it to contract by, by stimulating calcium release. So, uh, and that, that the, the, the resting membrane potential, so the resting charge of the muscle uh, fiber membrane is, is regulated by these, these ion transporter pumps. Uh, and the sodium potassium ATPase pump, as, as the name would suggest, is dependent on ATP. And it's, it's shown to be, or suggested to be primarily dependent on ATP from glycolysis. I don't think we necessarily need to get into that. We can, we can if we want to, but it's, it's, it's mostly dependent on ATP from glycolysis, which means the primary substrate for that is going to be glycogen. And again, because these, uh, these, these pumps are located in the T tubule mostly, uh, and the closest glycogen source to the T tubule is intramyofibular glycogen, um, the idea is that this is the primary source of ATP for these pumps to work. When they begin to fail, what happens is you see a, a depolarization of the muscle membrane. And what that means is it essentially becomes, uh, or sorry, a repolarization of the muscle membrane. And it's, it's essentially less, um, it's less sensitive to stimulation. And that means when you get an action potential fired, when you get a signal from the central nervous system to the muscle membrane, uh, 
it's it's less receptive to the signal and therefore its response being the contraction is poorer. Uh, and again, if there's a, a depletion of intramyofibular glycogen, there's a lower availability of substrate, there's less energy available for these, these ion pumps to work, the membrane becomes less receptive to signal and fatigue occurs. So it's probably a mix of these mechanisms together. Uh, the authors in this case have just in, uh, suggested one of them, but it, it's possibly a more uh, complex phenomenon. But mm. uh, yeah, that, that is why. And so I guess uh, uh, kind of ambling back to, to the initial point we made in the introduction section where, you know, looking at glycogen depletion overall, is not necessarily going to give you a good picture if you see a large amount of glycogen depletion in regions of glycogen that are very important for offsetting fatigue, in this case, intramyofibular glycogen, which is what this paper sets out to, to explore. Right, right, because I suppose the, the thinking behind like, oh, well, 30% of 30% uh, depletion, depletion of muscle glycogen, if we were to relate this back to, and bear with me now for a moment, endurance exercise for a moment, the phenomenon of hitting a wall effectively is basically when muscle glycogen is like, like fully depleted effectively yeah. and you can't generate ATP at the same rate. So you can't run as fast, no matter how hard you're trying because you're having to rely then on less efficient uh, ways of producing ATP at that point. So you can't, you can't run as quickly. So that's not going to occur in resistance exercise in the, in the same way that you get a complete depletion. Um, but there are other ways in which it can affect the, the generation of force, which is what we're interested in for um, resistance exercise performance. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, would, will we stay on the introduction? I don't know if there's much left to say on that, um, other than they, they've just essentially identified that, you know, estimates of glycogen depletion and resistance exercise are, are, are lower than what is reported for endurance exercise. Um, but it's, it's not as well reported in a more nuanced context than what is, um, what has been done for, for endurance exercise. And actually these researchers have done some work on cross country skiers in particular, where they've looked at, um, uh, different subfractions of glycogen and depletion in response to uh, endurance exercise. Uh, well, un unless if you want to elaborate on that point, I think we can more or less move on to the uh, methods. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's relevant. We, we've rambled enough. So it's, yeah. it's probably, and actually, like, like you say, I was very impressed with the, the session that they actually, firstly, the, the, the participants that they recruited and, and the session that they, they performed, it was uh, very like I would have done, I've done training sessions that are maybe not identical to this, but they wouldn't be far off it. So it mm. is, you know, um, it is pretty ecological. So we could maybe move on to that, uh, talk through the methods and then look at the results. That's the exciting part. Sure. Yeah. So we have um, 10 competitive male powerlifters and Olympic weightlifters. The, uh, their strength levels were quite impressive. Uh, so a mean back squat of 210 kilos mean bench press of 150 kilos and 243 uh, kilos in the deadlift they didn't specify um, how strong the olympic weightlifters were in the competition lifts so in the snatch and clean and jerk so we don't know how good the actual weightlifters were as as olympic weightlifters but uh overall they were they were pretty strong um yeah yeah and i i suppose that's not like it's nice to know but it's not particularly relevant because they're ju they're just doing a, a squat and deadlift workout anyway so it's, mm -hmm. it's 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 but yeah you know yourself and i i actually would have liked to have seen uh, because there's only 10 of them i wouldn't have mind seeing like participant by participant or at least a breakdown between the groups to see if i, I would have to presume the powerlifters had bigger squats than the weightlifters and deadlifts and obviously bench presses as well so it would have just been nice to see what the um the separation was but it's not the end of the world yeah um so then just before we talk about the the exercise session that they performed it might be important to note uh upon arrival so i have it highlighted here so after they arrive after an overnight fast, uh, the participants were 
provided with a standardized pre-exercise meal consisting of <laughs> bread, chicken, nuts, and greens, which is a, an interesting combination. But I, I think on balance, I'm I'm kind of glad they did that because again, it feeds back to the the ecological validity side of things. Um, like <sighs> having your subjects fasted is a great way to control certain things, but relating it back to what people do in practice, um, I think it falls down a little bit. And they do note in the discussion that this is a potentially even a limitation of the study because you know if you have um uh, if you have nutrients available to you uh or provided to you pre-exercise then there could actually be some resynthesis of glycogen going on between sets and immediately after the the training session um but the way i would look at it is and uh, we'll come to when we talk about the results in a while is that it, even that withstanding we still see these these results where there's still quite a substantial reduction in in the uh subcellular uh glycogen content yeah and i i think one of the other things is as well um if they had come in and performed this exercise about fasted they would have had some degree of glycogen depletion from the overnight fast i mean you're still talking about like you know maybe eight to ten hours of someone not eating um and that would induce some modest glycogen depletion and um, i also think as well that is is controls for i think from a practical perspective and this is more anecdotal telling participants that they're doing a study related to glycogen depletion and telling them that they have to fast they're going to be like oh i'm going to be starving i want to do well in that 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 exercise bout so you'll get people to eat a load of carbs before as in the night before in the previous meal now that's not necessarily a problem arguably it's a good thing the problem is it's going to vary between participants and increase variability in your data but if you can say to your participants yeah you need to over overnight fast but we're going to feed you before you do the bout people may become in more consistent in their behavior of the night before because they're not so much worried about being underprepared for the, the particularly because these are athletes and this is kind of the way athletes think and athletes behave. Uh, they're not going to feel um, underprepared for the uh, training session because they go, oh, I'm going to have to be grand, you know, so more anecdotal, but uh, again, it's another reason that I, and, and like you say, it's more ecological as well. Like you want to know if this is meaningful in practice and most people, particularly serious lifters who are quite trained, will will eat at least, um, you know, with some close proximity to, you know, in an hour or two before a training bout. So it's, mm. it's you know, you want to know if this works in context or not, because that's important. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't think it's a limitation. Yeah. Uh, another thing as well I, I found interesting to, just to think about and maybe you can shed some light on this because I know you have trained after a biopsy. Um, like, does that affect your movement or like, do you find it harder to, uh, to squat afterwards? Or is there anything that like, would it interfere with the performance of the, the exercise session in any way, do you think? Uh, yeah, I've actually done aerobic and resistance exercise after a, a muscle biopsy. Uh, I thought I thought it was fine. No, the study I did actually, I did a study that involved um, involved doing an exercise bout, and they recommended I didn't train after getting the biopsy, but I did anyway because I like training. Uh, I would say it was it was kind of like it felt like like I mean the 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 pain you get after a muscle biopsy feels like doms or a dead leg. So the way I would describe it is uh, if you've ever gone on holidays, you know, taken a week off training, you do your first session back and it's OK. But the second session back, you are incredibly sore and it hurts to do, but you just push through it and it's OK. That's how I would describe and even a mild version of that as what um, squatting with post biopsy feels like. Hmm. So I, I think if these were true, because I, I actually thought about this myself when I was reading the study. Um, these were trained lifters. I imagine they would have previously done sessions with a similar level of uh, discomfort, like in terms of DOMS or something like that, 
uh, a similar level of discomfort that the biopsy would induce. So I think while they wouldn't be too happy about it, I, I, I think it would be a sensation that the participants are relatively familiar with. So I, I actually, again, I, I don't know if it would uh, influence results. I doubt it. And it's not, it's, it's not an easy session, but it's not an incredibly hard session either. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so any, anything else on the measures that were taken? Uh, oh, actually, we should probably talk about the, the exercise protocol. So um, three exercises, uh, back squat, deficit deadlift, and a rear foot elevated split squat. So the back squat and the deficit deadlift were both done. Uh, they were both performed at between 70 and 75% of one RM for four sets of five. And the rear foot elevated split squat uh, was performed at between 60 and 70% of one RM for four sets of 12. Um, the rest between sets on the squat and deadlift was three to six minutes. Again, I, I'm all about that, ecologically valid. <laughs> and on the rear foot, ele rear foot ele elevated split squats, one to two minutes. Uh, so that's nice. Those, those rest intervals must be a bit short by your uh, perspective. <laughs> You're on the shorter end, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the, just for, I guess, for applicability, I think the, the average, so because it was 70, 75%, I, I think it works out as somewhere between like 155 and 162 or three kilos on the squat. That's what they were squatting. Uh, I can't remember what their deadlift was. And these were self-reported 1RMs. That's a, another thing to, to add. They didn't actually measure 1RM, which I thought was a bit disappointing, but kind of, I've done that in studies, so I can't call anyone out on it. Um, one of the things I really liked about this, I don't know if you saw this, so the, the because one of the things I was curious about was would they provide uh, criteria for depth and stuff like that. And they actually say in the measurements that they were told, they told the participants that they should perform squats to the standard recommended by the International Powerlifting Federation, which I'm sure you're chuffed with. And also they could use equipment that was in line with the International Powerlifting Federation guidelines, which leads me to only presume that like belts, knee sleeves and weightlifting shoes were used by participants. Um, I know if it was me up at around this percentage of 1RM, I, I would be using a belt. So um, unless I'm soft, I imagine most of them were using it as well, although it's not reported whether mm. there was variations in it. But I actually, again, I like those standards because it's ecological, you know, um, that's that's how people would train, particularly the powerlifters, presuming they were IPF powerlifters, and also just saying things like, yeah, you can use your weightlifting shoes. Yeah, you can use your, your knee sleeves or your belt or your wrist wraps if you want for, for squatting, uh, you can, which is, which is is nice you don't really see this in studies yeah uh okay um any, anything on the analytical procedures that you want to highlight yes uh I, I don't think we need to talk about the the biopsy sampling they essentially just took a muscle sample from the vastus lateralis which is just the the uh, large muscle on the outside of your quads um what they looked at essentially yeah if we're looking at the so they've done two things here. Now, this is the MHC one, MHC or figure one, which uh, just shows the distribution of different MHC isoforms. Um, they've done this via Western blot. So all, all they're doing here is giving an indication of the distribution of different muscle fiber types. Um, if you've listened to our previous podcast where we talk about this in detail, you should be more than familiar with the differences in mice and heavy chain isoforms. But it, essentially, and they're just demonstrating that in the, the samples that they've extracted, um, they seem to actually be roughly 50-50% type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers by the estimates performed, um, uh, sorry, by the, the by, by MHC method. Um, and, and again, that's just showing the distribution of muscle fibers. The next thing they do is they actually to identify muscle fibers when they're talking about the uh, looking at the different compartments of glycogen, they actually use a different technique and this is uh, semi quantitative. So all they're doing with this figure one is saying what the rough distribution in the sample was. So it was roughly half type one and half type two uh, muscle fibers, um, although there could be hybrids in there, you wouldn't know. Um, what they do when they're looking at the glycogen 
Some fractions is something different. So all of this study uses um, what I would describe as semi or quasi quantitative techniques. So it's all done using an electron microscope, which is essentially looking visually at the muscle samples and using a subjective visual appraisal of, uh, you know, uh, things that are identified in the images as methods of identifying whether it is a type one or a type two muscle fiber as well as uh, quantifying the actual subcellular localizations of glycogen itself. So it's probably worth just talking about that technique uh, and essentially how they identify the muscle fibers using the, or the muscle fiber type using the electron microscope is basically just off um, the, the morphology or the, the anatomy of different um, molecular elements of the muscle fiber. So there's two things specifically they use in this technique or two things they look at in this technique. Uh, the first is something called, they look at the, the, the Z disc of the sarcomeres. And if you remember from our previous podcast, if you've happened to listen to it, the sarcomeres are the individual units that make up each myofibril. So if the myofibril is the rod that penetrates all the way through the muscle fiber and is involved in contraction, uh, if you imagine that that's a cylinder made of Lego blocks, uh, a sarcomere is each individual Lego block in the lego cylinder that's the way to imagine it so they look at something called the m line which is something that 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 is uh, it's essentially an anchoring point for myosin which is in in the middle of the sarcomere uh, and type one muscle fibers have uh, they have thicker more dense m lines uh, they also have more uh, repetition of the m line in in each um, muscle fiber uh, and then they also look at the Z disc and the Z disc is basically the, the zone that discriminates between two sarcomeres. So again, going back to my Lego analogy, the Z disc would be the area where one Lego block connects to another in the, the Lego cylinder. And again, uh, the Z discs in uh, type one muscle fibers are more dense and more pronounced. And this, this technique has been arguably validated. So they cite a study where they use this subjective measurement of looking at the muscle fibers under a microscope as a means of identifying them and then compare it to, to an enzyme-based technique, um, which is previously validated. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a weakness of the study, although it's a necessary weakness um, because it is subjective. So it's, it's, if it was me doing this study, it's me looking down a microscope and going, yeah, that looks thicker than the other one, or yeah, there's more repetitions there. This must be a type one fiber. Um, so it's, it, it has some degree of validation behind it, but it's, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, it's just, it, I imagine the only way they could do it without, um, a lot of the times when you do these assays, say like something you might have to do to measure subcellular localization of glycogen, to identify it also as a muscle fiber using the same technique, you'd have to damage it somehow or treat it with something that would affect one assay would affect another essentially. So you have to come up with a way you can do both at the same time, which is, is why they've done this technique. Um, and then when they look at the, the subcellular compartments of glycogen, essentially they just identify them by looking at them. And then there's softwares you can use that will essentially count the pictures or count the pixels in each uh, image on the microscope. And you can use that to get the, the size of each glycogen particle, the amount of each glycogen particle, and then you can just kind of um, use that to, to estimate the, the glycogen concentration in, in pre and post exercise samples. Mm -hmm. So the techniques they use here, they're nice because they, they give context. You get to see this in, again, in, in a very nuanced uh, setting, but they're not perfect because there's a degree of subject or there's a greater degree of subjectivity to them compared to, um, you know, like enzyme based assays or antibody based assays, more quantitative measurements, uh, unfortunately, but like this work is by no means easy to do so you can criticize them for it but like. I wouldn't go to town on them because go and try and do it yourself and tell me how you get on you know would kind of be my my, my standpoint on that, but it is a limitation. Yep, that's fair. Uh, okay. So, uh, anything else in the methods? No, I, I, I'm happy if you're happy mm. uh, on that. I'm extremely happy. <laughs> rare for you. also rare for you. <laughs> uh, right, we'll jump to the results then. Um, yeah. So as you as you sort of alluded to already, so basically basically a fifty fifty split between type one and type two. Uh, muscle fibers um, 
if you combine the type 2a and type 2x, which is interesting. And then the muscle glycogen data then, so muscle glycogen concentration decreased uh, by, so sorry, from 398 uh, pre-exercise to 249, um, corresponding to a 38% uh, reduction, which is in line with the other papers that, uh, that I cited or that they cited rather in the in the introduction. Yeah, and it's actually just worth worth mentioning. So we 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 quantify glycogen uh, in a unit called uh, millimoles per kilogram dry weight. Um, you don't need to to know what how that unit works. Um, but essentially, in in a in a rested individual, um, the resting concentrations would be normally somewhere between 500 and 600 uh, millimoles per kilogram dry weight. It's the last time I say that. Uh, and, and usually the threshold for what's considered kind of low glycogen, so a degree of glycogen depletion that will begin to impair uh, exercise performance, and again, that data is mostly or entirely related to aerobic exercise, uh, is, is around 200 uh, millimoles per kg of dry weight. Okay, that's definitely the last time I say that. So uh, what, what you see here is you see quite a, 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 um, an expected level of uh, resting glycogen uh, concentration in these individuals and a depletion that is lower but not in the threshold or, or kind of only orbiting around the threshold whereby you would begin to expect it to impair performance that that's probably um just worth commenting on there mm -hmm. okay so th then it starts to get really interesting when we look at the the subfractions of glycogen uh so uh, I, I don't want to step in your territory here. Do you want to do you want to take it away here, or do you want me to um, go through this? Yeah, well, yeah, you can go ahead if you if you like. Mm -hmm. I don't mind. Yeah. So the type one fibers demonstrated a decrement in inter uh, myofibrillar glycogen. So remember that's the uh, that's the between myofibrillar glycogen content. Uh, so that was a thirty three percent reduction. Um, but a very a much smaller reduction in the intra myofibrillar, uh, so within the myofibrils uh, glycogen content. So that's a twenty percent reduction, and the subsarcolemmal glycogen content was down eight percent. In the type two fibers, the glycogen decrements observed in the inter myofibrillar subfractions uh, forty eight percent. Um, in the intra myofibrillar. 54% and the subsarcal level uh, of 47%. And what's interesting as well is if you look at the, the ranges there. So for example, the intra myofibrillar um, glycogen content reduced by 54% on average, but in some instances it was as much as 70%. Uh, yeah, and then one of the other things is if you want to if you want to compare that back to the type one muscle fibers as well. In some cases, the the, min the minimum change in intramyofibular glycogen they determined in uh, a type one muscle fiber was an increase of twenty one percent. So that's now I, I don't know if that's methodological or not. Um, now there's there's a couple of caveats I would put here because this if you were to go and read this paper it's a little bit confusing because they talk about the changes of glycogen relative to the subfraction. So what I mean by that is you go, for example, in a type one fiber, there was a 33% change in muscle, or sorry, let's use the type two fiber because it's a better example. In the type two fiber, there was a, uh, you know, about a 48% change in intermyofibular glycogen. And there was a 54% on average change in intramyofibular glycogen. But you have to remember that, let's say 80% of total muscle glycogen is actually in the intermyofibular space. Mm. So a 50% reduction of 80% means 40% of total muscle glycogen was depleted in the intermyofibular space, which is still a lot, you know? Uh, and then obviously I'm gonna be lazy with my maths here and say 50% of intramyofibular glycogen was depleted. So that's 5% of total muscle glycogen. Now that's not me um, kind of, um, sparring with the narrative that these authors have taken because intramyofibular glycogen 
while in lower abundance, uh, its depletion in the context of where it's located, um, like having only 5%, say, intramyofibular glycogen overall, uh, does have, you know, uh, a basis for connotations for fatigue. But it's just worth noting that all of this focuses on the intramyofibular space, but there was still a, a quite an appreciable depletion of, of um, intramyofibular glycogen when you look at it in the context of the whole glycogen pool. Um, that's, that's probably worth commenting on. But yeah, the, the whole point of this finding in, in what, they, what they show is essentially there was lower overall glycogen depletion in type 1 muscle fibers, and those are kind of more colloquially referred to as slow twitch muscle fibers and are generally more associated with endurance exercise. Uh, and within the type 1 muscle fiber, there was far less depletion and in some cases uh, a gain in the intramyofibular glycogen, which is the subfraction that in the context of this paper we're considering as being most um, relevant for the generation of fatigue and task failure, i.e. hitting failure, missing a rep. Mm. Uh, the opposite was found in type 2 muscle fibers where you saw um, uh, a higher degree of overall depletion and the majority of depletion and sometimes almost total depletion in the, the intramyofibular space. Now there's context there that also needs to be to be brought up. So one, one of the things that they mention in the methods, I don't actually know how true this is uh, off the top of my head, but they talk about selecting the percentage of 1RM as it being um, to a level where you would see a, a fairly high degree of the recruitment of muscle fibers. And you have to remember the total amount of muscle fibers you will recruit when lifting will kind of scale with the intensity of the lifting. So essentially 100% of 1RM, you are recruiting all of the muscle fibers you are capable of recruiting uh, at that given time, given your, your training status. So it's not to say I wouldn't interpret this finding. It's quite easy to look at it and go, the type two muscle fibers were recruited more and that's why they saw a higher degree of glycogen depletion because you actually can't say that from this data. And the reason you can't is in general, type two muscle fibers are uh, more dependent on glycolysis than type one muscle fibers. So essentially in any context where you see uh, a proportion of type two and type one muscle fibers recruited together, you will always see greater glycogen depletion in the type two muscle mm. fibers because they're more reliant on it as a substrate. So I would just add that caveat to that because it's very easy to look at that data and go, oh, the type two muscle fibers are more glycogen depleted because they were worked more. Uh, that might be the case, but you actually can't prove that with this data ju just because of, of that fact. Um, but yeah, it's interesting all the same, because again, you, you're arguably seeing the largest amount of total glycogen depletion across the muscle, uh, perhaps being in type two muscle fibers. And, you know, again, um, in the relative sense of glycogen within a muscle fiber, you're seeing the lowest amount of muscle glycogen within the context of a given subfraction being in the intramyofibular space, which uh, we know is, is relevant for fatigue. So what that would what that would suggest is that actually, when considered in context, uh, glycogen could be quite important for resistance yeah. exercise performance. Yeah, so that's actually an excellent point that you make, um, that we can't look at the muscle glycogen depletion data in isolation and use that as a proxy for uh, muscle fiber recruitment, you know, whether it was like more type one and type two. And in fact, there was one of the papers that they cited in the introduction. I think it was the, the Essen, Gustafsson and Tesh paper from 1990. Um, they actually showed a quite a profound use of um, intramu in, intramuscular, uh, intramuscular lipid as a fuel source for the, the exercise session. And they haven't looked at that here, but that is something that you might, you might suspect would be of a higher proportion in type one fibers um, because it can contribute then more to uh, aerobic meta um, metabolism. So without, without the use of, uh, uh, sorry, am I using the right word? Yeah, without the use of uh, carbohydrate for, uh, to produce ATP, I might have my terms. Yeah, you, you get what no, I'm saying. No, it's, it, yeah, it, it, it's difficult to know because you will see 
Um, you're correct. And the reason that type 2 muscle fibers um, are part of the reason type 2 muscle fibers are more dependent on glycolysis is they have a lower density of mitochondria. So they have a lower capacity for oxidative phosphorylation. In general. Sorry, uh, oxidative phosphorylation being the, the energy production um, mechanism that is performed within the mitochondria. So if you have less mitochondria, you know, uh, if, you, if you have less oxidative engine capacity, so to speak, will you have to apply on, on non-oxidative um, methods? So uh, that's one thing. And then again, you, you would arguably see, uh, I actually don't know if there's higher concentrations of intramuscular um, triglyceride in type one muscle fibers. I, I would have to guess that there is for the very same reason. Um, what's the point of like, if you've got, you know, if, if you've got a, a car with a diesel engine, what's the point in having a, a couple of liters of, you know, petrol fuel in the boot, you know, kind of it's, it's, it's going to go to waste. Um, so th that is perhaps true, but, but I'm not sure. Uh, one of the things, and they do discuss this a little bit later on in the discussion, but we'll talk about it now. Uh, one of the issues as well is it, it's very, very difficult to uh, estimate substrate utilization or what fuels are being used uh, during resistance exercise. Uh, it's, it's, it's well studied in aerobic exercise and, and we, can, we can estimate it using uh, indirect calorimetry, which is essentially, if you've ever seen someone do like a VO2 max test, it's where they've got a gas mask on and gas exchange is, is measured uh, along with kind of respiration rate and, and other variables. And, you know, knowing how much oxygen someone is consuming uh, and how much carbon dioxide they're producing, we, we can use kind of equation-based uh, methods to figure out what their substrate utilization is at that point in time. It's harder to do that in resistance exercise because it's, it's less continuous. You know, you're, you're doing um, resistance exercise, you know, you're doing, it might take you a minute to do a set of six reps, but that's only, you know, six muscle contractions in a minute. And it's very hard to, because the reps are so quick, it's very hard to actually capture what the substrate utilization through indirect calorimetry it's probably impossible was during the actual movement of the lift itself because mm. you, you're getting so little data out of it compared to running where you can get someone to run on a treadmill for 40 minutes for an hour and they're running continuously um you, you can't really do that with resistance exercise so it's very hard to know what the difference between substrate utilization during a lift is versus using those substrates to recover and prepare for subsequent lifts. So what I mean by that is, was the glycogen predominantly depleted or intramuscular lipid? Uh, in the case of this example, predominantly depleted during the lifts as a fuel, or was it broken down to produce energy to recover from the lifts between sets? Because th those are potentially kind of two different things. Uh, and they, they do actually potentially have, um, different practical implications, you know, because if glycogen is say mostly used for recovery between sets, if you have a low set day where you're just doing three sets of two, that's maybe not that big of a deal that you missed out on a few carbohydrates uh, in between sets. But if it's used as fuel within sets predominantly, well then you, your training session may be um, uh, much more difficult, you know? So, so th there is practical considerations there and it, it's hard to know when you can't tell from this paper. Mm. So that was a bit of a tangent. So I guess if someone is or has listened up to this point and they're thinking, right, heretofore I was of the opinion that we get roughly about a 30% reduction in muscle glycogen content, you know, give or take, uh, following a typical resistance exercise session. But when we look, but now I'm of the, uh, it's now my understanding that when we look a little bit deeper, um, the relative depletion uh, at the subcellular level might be a good bit higher than that. So I'm wondering how do I translate this now to what I do like with, with my pre-exercise nutrition or perhaps even my intra-exercise nutrition? How, how should I maybe consider this um, in light of that, if, if that makes any sense? Yeah, it, it's funny because... Uh... I always feel like we, we try to do these to look at like kind of, you know, more translational papers and then apply practical recommendations. 
And uh, we can do that here, but the problem is I don't think it's going to change anyone's behavior because most people who are lifters that I know are just going to do what they've already what they're already doing because it's mm. the right thing to do. So the implication here is that really, like previously, the way we'd looked at glycogen depletion in a homogenous sample would say it's modest and therefore it's not that much of a concern. What we see in this paper is uh, it's less modest in type two muscle fibers, which are obviously important for resistance training performance, but also within um, subcellular fractions of type two muscle fibers, especially that are associated with fatigue. So you would say, okay, well then maybe ensuring I have optimal glycogen replenishment, uh, perhaps within workouts, which I'll talk about in a second, but more, more importantly to me, uh, or I think what would be more important is between workouts, so between training sessions. Now, the, the, the problem here is like, like when you look at, I, I could go and go, all right, I went to the, you know, the IOC and I looked at their recommendations for carbohydrate uh, refueling for um, glycogen repletion. Uh, and they do, they do have guidelines on those, but they're entirely based off uh, aerobic exercise or endurance exercise, which is going to see far greater glycogen depletion probably overall, um, just in light of the fact that uh, endurance athletes train more than strength athletes by a hop, a skip and a mile and a half. So th the recommendations based off that are depending on the uh, volume and the intensity of the session, somewhere between five to 12 grams uh, of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight per day for, for optimal glycogen repletion. Uh, but like, like something like 12 grams would be, uh, I, I would I can only speculate firstly, because I'm nowhere near a nutrition practitioner. And secondly, because these guidelines aren't really fit for purpose, but I would say something on the, on the lower end of that, where you're talking about like three to four grams per kilogram of per kg per day of carbohydrate, you know, looking, ensuring that you're eating something like that. Um, most especially if you are engaged in a high volume phase of training, you know, like you're doing eights, tens, twelves, etc. Just make sure you're eating enough carbohydrates. Make sure you're eating it perhaps uh, like maybe having the density of that carbohydrate consumption being mostly based around training. So before your training session and after your training session and glycogen repletion is also enhanced with protein co-ingestion. So perhaps in your post-workout meal or both meals, um, have a dose of protein alongside the carbohydrate. Now, I say that that's a decent recommendation, but I think that's what everyone's already doing already. Yeah, yeah. which is <laughs> which is why you go. So, you know, what what's the big takeaway? And the takeaway would be if you're not doing that, maybe consider it. But you probably are doing it anyway. So, you know, uh, I feel a bit useless as per usual. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose the the timing of the posts exercise um uh, carbohydrate ingestion doesn't need to be approached too neurotically because um effectively if you're talking about something like powerlifting it might be a little bit different in weightlifting because i know that you guys are going to use the same uh muscles more frequently in general but like if it's powerlifting you know, if you're if you're doing this kind of session, it's highly likely you're not going to squat and and or deadlift again for 48, 72 hours at a minimum, I would say. So like there's ample time to replenish uh, glycogen between those sessions, as long as, you know, again, like I was kind of getting out at the start, like as long as you're not taking the piss and doing something extreme like keto, you're going to be fine. That's kind of how I see it anyway. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm 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 inclined to agree. Um, <laughs> one day we'll have good recommendations for people that, that yeah, make yeah. a difference and change the world, but it's not today, anyway. Yeah. Uh, right. A anything else you want to touch on with this paper? Um, I know I, I didn't actually afford you the opportunity to to go through any of the figures here or anything within the discussion. Um, was there anything else you wanted to to highlight for people? No, I, I mean, I think we've discussed what's in the discussion and, and what I would recommend is, I, I don't know if you're uh, like, ah, message us if you want to look at the paper and we can we can figure out a way to send it to you. It's not a big deal, but if, if people are interested in looking at the, the pictures and getting a, a greater understanding of the methods they've actually used, particularly because these are, are semi-quantitative methods, but 
Um, no, not particularly. And I think we 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 touch on what is touched on in the discussion um, throughout this conversation, anyway. Um, so no, I'm I'm actually I'm actually quite happy. I'm gonna go have a sandwich now or something like that to prepare me for training. Yes. Whenever I can train again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess we can conclude with uh, have your uh, have your sandwich and uh, have your jellies between sets if you were already doing so. <laughs> what, whatever you do, don't listen to Sean Baker. Uh, or liver liver king as yeah. well is he the other one liver, oh uh, christ yeah <laughs> no thanks um all right cool i think we can wrap it up there so uh ian pleasure as always and to anyone who's uh sat through the hour or so that we've been chatting um thank you for doing so we we appreciate it and if you've any follow-up questions don't be afraid to message myself on the no Lift podcast instagram page uh or ian uh bean swole isn't it yeah that's my that's my public instagram handle now that's jesus i wish i had something more professional now. <laughs> but yeah bean, bean swole is my 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 instagram which is i think the only social media i really use so that's that's probably the place to find me that's stuff right uh thanks again and uh until next time take care and we'll talk to you all soon Thank you very much.